<laughs> Welcome everyone! Welcome along! Welcome along to another ghost story reading with me, Luke. That's me, Luke Westway. Hi! Hi everyone, it's great to see a bunch of familiar names in the chat. Hello everyone! Uh, oh yeah, I recognise some of our ghost story regulars there. Uh, let me know if this is your first time joining one of these spooky story readings. I'd be interested to know. Hopefully there's at least one person who's this is their first time viewing or or I'm not growing and that's bad. I'm no business expert. <laughs> and it's quite something to call what we do here a business. <laughs> but I do know you're supposed to grow. So oh well, let me know so that I can say hello. Uh, apart from anything else. Oh, JP Trick says second time for me. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, first time for uh, Nat Jan. Ishibasha? I Ishibashi? I'm so sorry uh, for mangling your name there. Welcome along. Welcome. It's so nice to have you. Oh, cool. Oh, there we go. All right. We do have some first timers. Awesome. Uh, Jules, Magnificent Hash Brown. First time. It is I, Magnificent Hash Brown. Magnificent Hash Brown. How did we get along without you? I love a Hash Brown. 
Hey everyone, good to see you all. Gentle Mandrill says, always up for more Karnaki. Also, what's everyone's drink of choice for today's spookening? I went for whiskey on the rocks for today. Let's talk about drinks, shall we? Let's get that Let's get that out of the way. Um, right. Oh, Donna Berman, first time as well. First time catching it live for Matt Titmus. Oh. Oh. Well, there's loads of you watching the stream for the first time. That makes me, that actually makes me feel, um, that actually makes me feel good. Night. Oh, well, we'll do this every time. We'll do this every time. We'll check in. Check in. Um, cool. All right. Well, drinks. Uh, so, I have sensible hydrating water. There it is. Look at me ghostly reaching for... Oh, spooky. Where's his arm gone? Ooh, the real mystery. Oh, there it is. Just water. Just water. And then in the goblet this week, we've got the... Oh, my gosh. I've got the blue goblet. But look, it's gone translucent with the... I mean, not with the green screen, with, with regular magic. That is cool. Do you know why that is? It's because the goblet is blue, but inside it is beer. And so it's combined to be a shade of green. Uh, I'm drinking beer tonight. Um, normally I try to go for something a little bit more classy, a bit more old timey. But hey, it's a beautiful summer evening here in London. It's very warm. And that calls for, if you ask me, a frosty beer. Mmm, delicious. Uh, Grumpy Cheshire Cat says, so ready for this. Spook me, daddy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Princess Wish says, punk IPA here. Not very spooky. Well, that's, I mean, I'm not drinking, I'm drinking Asahi. That's, the, you know, but yeah, there we go. It's fine. Beer can be haunting. Um, cool. All right. So for those who are new and for those who are returning uh, viewers on these streams, we read... An old ghost story. Today we are reading The Horse of the Invisible, which I'm very, very excited to read. Uh, it is another uh, Karnaki the Ghost Finder uh, story by William Hope Hodgson is the author. We talked about William Hope Hodgson um, last time because we read the first Karnaki the Ghost Finder story, which was The Gateway of the Monster. Karnaki is an enigmatic ghost finder. These stories all have the same structure. Um, people go visit Karnaki at his place in London, and he tells them about an investigation of his, which is a pretty cool setup. John Sharpen, thank you very much for the super chat, saying, Hi Luke, question for you before we kick off. Has the Oxventure being only online right now made it easier for you to try DMing, or would you still have done it at a live or non-live setting? Oh, okay, all right, well, that's a day job question. But yeah, um, so uh, I, I suspect many, if not all of you, um, know me or follow me from outside extra and might know that i'm doing my first bit of dungeons and dragons dming tomorrow which i am so nervous about but also excited it's going to be real fun um i think it being it, it's hard to say because honestly the the urge to dm uh only came upon me after we did uh, a werewolf live stream on outside extra which i ran and i had to run it because um it was my idea and I was running OBS and it only makes sense for the person who's running the stream uh, to be running the game of Werewolf. And I just had so much fun. I, I was really struck by how much more fun I had running the game than I had by playing it. Dungeons and Dragons is way more complicated than Werewolf. Um, I, I have crammed so many rules in my head, most of which I'm sure will go out the window. But so it's hard to say whether the onlineness. I mean, we wouldn't have we probably wouldn't have done... We probably only did Werewolf because we thought it would be a fun, like, live stream thing. To be honest, things have been so online only for so long at this point that it's impossible to figure out now what I would have been doing or thinking or wanting if everything was normal. So I don't know. I don't know. But um, to be honest, like, the fact that... Before um, before lockdown, all of the Ox Ventures were, were um, you know, apart from the ones we did at shows, were pre-recorded and then edited. Um, so doing it live was a bit of a, a bit of an obstacle to overcome. You know, like there were added nerves there because obviously it's live. You know, you can't edit out mistakes or when you get rules wrong and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I am nervy, but it'll be cool. Um Ah, oh, and Sil uh, Charonis, thank you very much for your super chat as well, Sil Charonis. He says, I can't stay, just wanted to say your streams are awesome. 
I watch them all, but I never catch the live streams. We'll watch this later. I hope you have a wonderful day, Luke, and my fellow Spooky Sad Squad. Hey, hey, the Spooky Sad Squad. I've been thinking recently I should do another music stream because I haven't, just haven't touched my keyboard in weeks, and I miss it. And uh, Abidosian Shulak 2 says, uh, don't worry about pronunciation, Abby is fine. Oh, I wish I'd read that bit first. Um, well, hopefully I didn't mangle that too badly. Hey, Abby, thank you so much for the super chat and for chiming in. You're helping me through my resume updating this afternoon, so cheers for the distraction, and thanks for everything you've done these several months. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Uh, it's, um, it, like, doing these streams has totally been part of my, uh, like, self-care during these weird times as well, so you are, you are more than welcome. Thank you for watching, because if nobody watched, I would feel weird doing this. I'd probably do it anyway, but I would feel weird doing it. I still feel weird doing it. What we do here is weird. There we go. Um, oh, and, uh, Dem, uh, DMU Girl 2008 says, I'm a regular, but I've never really commented. Well, DMU Girl 2008, thank you for commenting now. You don't have to comment if you, I get it. When I watch live streams, I'm never in the chat, to be honest, unless it's an outside extra, outside Xbox one or one of Ellen's or something, you know, on, um, yeah, it, I, I get it. Not everyone wants to chat. That's cool. All right. LeBlanc says it would be weirder if there was one single viewer. That would be weirder. Thanks, LeBlanc, <laughs> for pointing that out. Okay. Well, I've waffled on for probably long enough. Shall we crack on with the Horse of the Invisible? Just stretch out. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. I, I ne forgot the disclaimer before we began. Um... We read these stories uh, because we appreciate good ghost story. However, and it's cool to see where uh, modern horror tropes got their beginning, um, but beware the real nightmare, which is Victorian attitudes to all sorts of things like mental health, women, colonialism, sexuality, nationality, race. Uh, the list goes on uh, and is long. Um, but there, yeah. I always feel like it's worth adding that disclaimer because these stories are uh, pretty old. There we go. Uh, Eloquence Winter says, disclaimer, Victorians. Ugh. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, yeah. Pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Rebecca M says, also, as we discovered last week, animal abuse. Yeah, Victorian attitudes towards um, the livelihood of cats. I won't say any more in case you haven't watched that one yet. Okay, right. We're ready to crack on. The Horse of the Invisible. I'm excited for this one, folks. I can't wait to see what you make of it. I had that afternoon received an invitation from Karnaki. When I reached his place, I found him sitting alone. As I came into the room, he rose with a perceptibly stiff movement and extended his left hand. His face seemed to be badly scarred and bruised, and his right hand was bandaged. He shook hands and offered me his paper, which I refused. Then he passed me a handful of photographs and returned to his reading. Now that is just Karnaki. Not a word had come from him and not a question from me. He would tell us about it later. I spent about half an hour looking at the photographs, which were chiefly snaps by some flashlight, of an extraordinarily pretty girl, though in some of the photographs it was wonderful that her prettiness was so evident, for so frightened and startled was her expression that it was difficult not to believe that she had been photographed in the presence of some imminent and overwhelming danger. The bulk of the photographs were of interiors of different rooms and passages, and in every one the girl might be seen, either full length in the distance or closer, with perhaps little more than a hand or arm or portion of the head or dress included in the photograph. All of these had evidently been taken with some definite aim that did not have for its first purpose the picturing of the girl, but obviously of her surroundings, and they made me very curious, as you can imagine. Near the bottom of the pile, however, I came upon something definitely extraordinary. It was a photograph of the girl standing abrupt and clear in the great blaze of a flashlight, as was plain to be seen. Her face was turned a little upward, as if she had been frightened suddenly by some noise. Directly above her, as though half-formed and coming down out of the shadows, was the shape of a single enormous hoof. I examined this photograph for a long time, without understanding it more than that I had probably to do with some queer case in which Karnaki was interested. 
When Jessa, Parkwright and Taylor came in, Karnaki quietly held out his hand for the photographs, which I returned in the same spirit, and afterwards we all went in to dinner. When we had spent a quiet hour at the table, we pulled our chairs round and made ourselves snug, and Karnaki began. I've been up north, he said, speaking slowly and painfully between puffs at his pipe. Up to Hiskins of East Lancashire. It has been a pretty strange business all round, as I fancy you chaps will think when I have finished. I knew before I went something about the horse story, as I've heard it called, but I never thought of it coming my way somehow. Also, I know now that I never considered it seriously, in spite of my rule always to keep an open mind. Funny creatures, we humans. Well, I got a wire, asking for an appointment, which of course told me that there was some trouble. On the date I fixed, old Captain Hisgins himself came up to see me. He told me a great many new details about the horse story, though naturally I had always known the main points and understood that if the first child were a girl, that girl would be haunted by the horse during her courtship. It is, as you can see already, an extraordinary story, and though I have always known about it, I have never thought it to be anything more than an old-time legend, as I've already hinted. You see, for seven generations, the Hisgins family have had men children for their firstborn, and even the Hisginses themselves have long considered the tale to be little more than a myth. To come to the present, the eldest child of the reigning family is a girl, and she has been often teased and warned in jest by her friends and relations that she is the first girl to be the eldest for seven generations, and that if she would like to keep her men friends at arm's length, or else go into a nunnery. That is, if she hoped to escape the haunting. And this, I think, shows us how thoroughly the tale has grown to be considered as nothing worthy of the least serious thought, don't you think so? Two months ago, Miss Hisgins became engaged to Beaumont, a young naval officer, and on the evening of the very day of the engagement, before it was even formally announced, a most extraordinary thing happened, which resulted in Captain Hisgins making the appointment and my ultimately going down to their place to look into the thing. From the old family records and papers that were entrusted to me, I found that there could be no possible doubt that prior to something like a hundred and fifty years ago, there were some very extraordinary and disagreeable coincidences, to put the thing in the least emotional way. In the whole of the two centuries prior to that date, there were five firstborn girls out of a total of seven generations of the family. Each of these girls grew up to maidenhood and each became engaged, and each one died during the period of engagement. Two by suicide, one by falling from a window, one from a broken heart, presumably heart failure owing to sudden shock through fright. The fifth girl was killed one evening in the park round the house, but just how there seemed to be no exact knowledge, only that there was an impression that she had been kicked by a horse. She was dead when found. Now, you see, all of these deaths might be attributed, in a way, even the suicides, to natural causes. I mean, as distinct from supernatural. You see, yet, in every case, the maidens had undoubtedly suffered some extraordinary and terrifying experiences during their various courtships. For in all of the records, there was mention either of the neighing of an unseen horse or of the sound of an invisible horse galloping as well as many other peculiar and quite inexplicable manifestations. You begin to understand now, I think, just how extraordinary a business it was that I was asked to look into. I gathered from one account that the haunting of the girls was so constant and horrible that two of the girls' lovers fairly ran away from their lady loves. And I think it was this more than anything else that made me feel that there had been something more in it than a mere succession of uncomfortable coincidences. I got hold of these facts before I had been many hours in the house, and after this I went pretty carefully into the details of the thing that happened on the night of Miss Hisgins's engagement to Beaumont. It seems as if the two of them were going through the big lower corridor, just after dusk and before the lamps had been lighted. Then there had been a sudden horrible neighing in the corridor close to them. Immediately afterward, Beaumont received a tremendous blow or kick which broke his right forearm. Then the rest of the family and the servants came running to know what was wrong. Lights were brought in the corridor, and afterward the whole house searched, but nothing unusual was found. You can imagine the excitement in the house and the half-incredulous, half-believing talk about the old legend. 
But then later in the middle of the night, the old captain was waked by the sound of a great horse galloping round and round the house. Several times after this, both Beaumont and the girl said that they had heard the sound of hoofs near to them after dusk in several of the rooms and corridors. Three nights later, Beaumont was waked by a strange neighing in the night time, seeming to come from the direction of his sweetheart's bedroom. He ran hurriedly for her father, and the two of them raced to her room, where they found her awake and ill with sheer terror, having been awakened by the neighing seemingly close to her bed. The night before I arrived, there had been a fresh happening, and they were all in a frightfully nervy state, as you can imagine. I spent most of that first day, as I have hinted, in getting hold of details, but after dinner I slacked off and played billiards all the evening with Beaumont and Miss Hiskins. We stopped about ten o'clock and had coffee, and I got Beaumont to give me full particulars about the thing that had happened the evening before. He and Miss Hiskins had been sitting quietly in her aunt's boudoir, whilst the old lady chaperoned them behind a book. It was growing dusk and the lamp was at her end of the table. The rest of the house was not yet lit, as the evening had come earlier than usual. Well, it seems that the door into the hall was open, and suddenly the girl said, shh, shh, what's that? They both listened, and then Beaumont heard it too, the sound of a horse outside of the front door. Your father? He suggested, but she reminded him that her father was not riding. Of course, they were both ready to feel queer, as you can suppose, but Beaumont made an effort to shake this off, and went into the hall to see whether anyone was at the entrance. It was pretty dark in the hall, and he could see the glass panels of the inner draught door, clear-cut in the darkness of the hall. He walked over to the glass and looked through into the drive beyond, but there was nothing in sight. He felt nervous and puzzled, and opened the inner door and went out onto the carriage circle. Almost directly afterward, the great hall door swung to with a crash behind him. He told me that he had a sudden awful feeling of having been trapped in some way. That is how he put it. He whirled round and gripped the door handle, but something seemed to be holding it, with a vast grip on the other side. Then before he could be fixed in his mind that this was so, he was able to turn the handle and open the door. He paused a moment in the doorway and peered into the hall, for he had hardly steadied his mind sufficiently to know whether he was really frightened or not. Then he heard his sweetheart blow him a kiss from out of the greyness of the big, unlit hall, and he knew that she had followed him from the boudoir. He blew her a kiss back, and stepped inside the doorway, meaning to go to her. And then, suddenly, in a flash of sickening knowledge, he knew that it was not his sweetheart who had blown him that kiss. He knew that something was trying to tempt him alone into the darkness, and that the girl had never left the boudoir. He jumped back, and in the same instant of time he heard the kiss again, nearer to him. He called out at the top of his voice, Mary, stay in the boudoir! Don't move out of the boudoir until I come to you! He heard her call something in reply from the boudoir, and then he had struck a clump of a dozen or so matches and was holding them above his head and looking round the hall. There was no one in it, but even as the matches burned out, there came the sounds of a great horse galloping down the empty drive. Now, you see, both he and the girl had heard the sounds of the horse galloping, but when I questioned more closely, I found that the aunt had heard nothing. Though it is true she is a bit deaf, and she was further back in the room. Of course, both he and Miss Hisgins had been in an extremely nervous state, and ready to hear anything. The door might have been slammed by a sudden puff of wind owing to some inner door being opened. As for the grip on the handle, that may have been nothing more than the snick catching. With regards to the kisses and the sound of the horse galloping, I pointed out that these might have seemed ordinary enough sounds if they had been only cool enough to reason. As I told him, and as he knew, the sounds of a horse galloping carry a long way on the wind, so that what he had heard might have been nothing more than a horse being ridden some distance away. And as for the kiss, plenty of quiet noises, the, uh, the, the rustle of a paper or a leaf, uh, have somewhat similar sound, especially if one is in a an overstrung condition and imagining things. Well, I finished preaching this little sermon on common sense versus hysteria as we put out the lights and left the billiard room, but neither Beaumont nor Miss Hiskins would agree that there had been any fancy on their parts. We had come out of the billiard room by this time, 
and were going along the passage, and I was still doing my best to make both of them see the ordinary, commonplace possibilities of the happening. When what killed my pig, as the saying goes, was the sound of a hoof in the dark billiard room we had just left. I felt the creep come on me in a flash, up my spine and over the back of my head. Miss Hiskins whooped like a child with the whooping cough and ran round the passage, giving little gasping screams. Beaumont, however, ripped round on his heels and jumped back a couple of yards. I gave back too, a bit as you can understand. There he is, he said in a low, breathless voice. Perhaps you'll believe me now. There's some, certainly something, I whispered, never taking my gaze off the closed door of the billiard room. Hush, he muttered. There it is again. There was a sound, like a great horse pacing round and round the billiard room with slow, deliberate steps. A horrible cold fright took me so that it seemed impossible to take a full breath, you know the feeling, and then I saw we must have been walking backwards, for we found ourselves suddenly at the opening of the long passage. We stopped there and listened. The sound went on steadily, with a horrible sort of deliberateness as if the brute were taking a sort of malicious gusto in walking about all over the room in which we had just occupied. Do you understand what I mean? Well, then there was a pause and a long time of absolute quiet, except for an excited whispering from some of the people down in the big hall. The sound came plainly up the wide stairway. I fancy they were gathered round Miss Hiskins with some notion of protecting her. I should think Beaumont and I stood there at the end of the passage for about five minutes, listening for any noise in the billiard room. Well, then I realised what a horrible funk I was in and said to him, I'm going to go and see what's there. So am I, he answered. He was pretty white, but he had heaps of pluck. I told him to wait one instant, and I made a dash into my bedroom and got my camera and flashlight. I slipped my revolver into my right-hand pocket and a knuckle duster over my left fist, where it was ready and yet would not stop me from being able to work my flashlight. Then I ran to Beaumont. He held out his hand to show me that he had his pistol, and I nodded, but whispered to him not to be too quick to shoot, as there might be some silly practical joking at work after all. He had got a lamp from a bracket in the upper hall, which he was holding in the crook of his damaged arm, so that we had a good light. Then we went down the passage toward the billiard room, and you can imagine that we were a pretty nervous couple. All this time there had not been a sound, but abruptly when we were within perhaps a couple of yards of the door, we heard the sudden clumping of a hoof on the solid parquet floor of the billiard room. In the instant afterward, it seemed to me that the whole place shook beneath the ponderous hooffalls of some huge thing coming toward the door. Both Beaumont and I gave back a pace or two and, and then realised and hung on to our courage, as you might say, and waited. The great tread came right up to the door and then stopped. And there was an instant of absolute silence except that so far as I was concerned, the pulsing in my throat and temples almost deafened me. I dare say we waited quite half a minute, and then came the further restless clumping of a great hoof. Immediately afterwards, the sound came right on as if some invisible thing passed through the closed door and the ponderous tread was upon us. We jumped, each of us, to the side of the passage, and I know that I spread myself stiff against the wall. The clunk, clunk, clonk, clonk, of the great hoof-falls passed right between us, and slowly and with deadly deliberateness down the passage. I heard them through a haze of blood beats in my ear and temples, and my body was extraordinarily rigid and pringling, and I was horribly breathless. I stood for a little time like this, my head turned so that I could see up the passage. I was conscious only that there was a hideous danger abroad. Then suddenly my pluck came back to me. I was aware that the noise of the hoofbeat sounded near the other end of the passage. I twisted quickly and got my camera to bear and snapped off the flashlight. Immediately afterward, Beaumont let fly a storm of shots down the passage and began to run, shouting, It's after Mary! Run! Run! He rushed down the passage and I after him. We came out into the main landing and heard the sound of a hoof on the stairs, and after that nothing. And from thence onward, nothing. Down below us in the big hall... I could see a number of the household round Miss Hiskins, who seemed to have fainted, and there were several of the servants clumped together a little way off, staring up at the main landing and no one saying a single word. And about some twenty steps up the stairs was the old Captain Hiskins. 
He had a drawn sword in his hand where he had halted just below the last hoof sound. I think I never saw anything finer than that old man standing there between his daughter and that infernal thing. I dare say you can understand the queer feeling of horror I had at piercing, passing that place on the stairs where the sounds had ceased. It was as if the monster was still standing there, but invisible. And the peculiar thing was that we never heard another sound of the hoof, either up or down the stairs. After they had taken Miss Hiskins to her room, I sent word that I should follow, so soon as they were ready for me. And presently, when a message came to tell me that I could come any time, I asked her father to give me a hand with my instrument box, and between us we carried it into the girl's bedroom. I had the bed pulled well round into the middle of the room, after which I erected the electric pentacle round the bed. Let's take a break there. Right into it with this story, right? No hesitation. Bam! Straight into the horse haunting. Whew. Wild. What do we think so far? A few super chats that I missed while I was reading. Stanley Green says, Oh no, I keep missing these live. I do get some brilliant content to listen to while walking the dog though. Keep up the great work, Luke. Wow. Hopefully not while walking the dog at night. That would be intense. Oh no. Hannah Axelson says, and I'm sorry about this, folks, but they say, I've got, I've got to read, I feel like I have to read it out when they say, I must say that horse sounds a bit unstable. Hannah. Hannah, I bloody love it. Oh, and Fran Fry says, I'm late. Sorry, drum lessons took longer. Have a tip for my absence. Don't worry about it, Fran Fry. Glad to see you. Hope the drum lesson went well. Um, yeah, hope that hope that muscle memory's starting to come in. <laughs> okay, everyone's booing Hannah Axelson's horse sounds a bit unstable. But it was good. It was a good pun. It was a good pun. Okay, so... I'm going to take a little uh, sip of water and a little sip of beer and then I think we should crack on because we're still mid haunting. I don't want to I don't want to let up, but this story just the story just doesn't give you a break, does it? It just like bam, he's there. He's being haunted by a horse. The pace on these Karnaki stories. <laughs> Hannah Axelson says, I regret nothing. Yeah. Vivian Sassideran says, ha 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 ha, solid 10 out of 10. Yeah, I think so. Unstable. It's good. I mean, I was ready for horse puns. You know, the main event. The, you know, saddle up. That kind of thing. The devil makes work for bridal hands. <laughs> That's, that sort of thing. But unstable. I don't think I've heard it and it perfectly applies to this situation. So yes. Flawless. Well done. Okay. Let's continue. The electric pentacle is back. Did we spot that? Amazing. I still don't know what to picture for the electric pentacle. People in the in the comments had some suggestions. I still like to imagine a sort of neon light, a steampunk neon light in the shape of a, you know, the pentacle, the star that we're all familiar with from horror movies. That bit in horror movies where someone goes to a library, you know, and is like, do I need all your books on this? And then they bring out like a book full of old creepy woodcuts. Lots of pentacles in there. All right. We're still on Haunting Horse Night. I had the bed pulled well out into the middle of the room, after which I erected the electric pentacle round the bed. Then I directed that lamps should be placed round the room, but that on no account must any light be made within the pentacle, neither must anyone pass in or out. The girl's mother I had placed within the pentacle and directed that her maid should sit without, ready to carry any message so as to make sure that Mrs. Hisgins did not have to leave the pentacle. I suggested also that the girl's father should stay the night in the room and that he had better be armed. 
When I left the bedroom, I found Beaumont waiting outside the door in a miserable state of anxiety. I told him what I had done and explained to him that Miss Hiskins was probably perfectly safe within the protection, but that, in addition to her father remaining the night in the room, I intended to stand guard at the door. I told him that I should like him to keep me company, for I knew that he could never sleep, feeling as he did, and I should not be sorry to have a companion. Also, I wanted to have him under my own observation, for there was no doubt but that he was actually in greater danger in some ways than the girl. At least that was my opinion, and is still, as I think you will agree later. I asked him whether he would object to my drawing a pentacle round him for the night, and got him to agree, but I saw that he did not know whether to be superstitious about it, I ought to regard it more as a piece of foolish mumming, but he took it seriously enough when I gave him some particulars about the Black Veil case when young Astor died. You remember he said it was a piece of silly superstition and stayed outside. Poor devil. The night passed quietly enough until a little while before dawn, when we both heard the sounds of a great horse galloping round and round the house, just as old Captain Hiskins had described it. You can imagine how queer it made me feel, and directly afterwards... I heard someone stir within the bedroom. I knocked at the door, for I was uneasy, and the captain came. I asked whether everything was all right, to which he replied yes, and immediately asked me whether I had heard the galloping, so that I knew he had heard them also. I suggested that it might be well to leave the bedroom door open a little until the dawn came in, as there was certainly something abroad. This was done, and he went back into the room to be near his wife and daughter. I had better say here that I was doubtful whether there was any value in the defence about Miss Hiskins, for what I termed the personal sounds of the manifestation were so extraordinarily material that I was inclined to parallel the case with that one of Harford's, where the hand of the child kept materialising within the pentacle and patting the floor. As you will remember, that was a hideous business. Yet as it chanced, nothing further happened, and so soon as daylight had fully come, we all went off to bed. Beaumont knocked me up about midday and I went down and made breakfast into lunch. Miss Hiskins was there and seemed in very fair spirits, considering. She told me that I had made her feel almost safe for the first time in days. She told me also that her cousin, Harry Parskett, was coming down from London, and she knew that he would do anything to help find the ghost. And after that, she and Beaumont went into the grounds to have a little time together. I had to walk round the grounds myself, went round the house... Saw no traces of hoof marks, and after that I spent the rest of the day making an examination of the house, but found nothing. I made an end of my search before dark, and went to my room to dress for dinner. When I got down, the cousin had just arrived, and I found him one of the nicest men I have met for a long time. A chap with a tremendous amount of pluck, and the particular kind of man I like to have with me in a bad case like the one I was on. I could see that what puzzled him most was our belief in the genuineness of the haunting, and I found myself almost wanting something to happen, just to show him how true it was. As it chanced, something did happen, with a vengeance. Beaumont and Miss Hisgins had gone out for a stroll just before the dusk, and Captain Hisgins asked me to come into his study for a short chat, while Parskett went upstairs with his traps, for he had no man with him. I had a long conversation with the old captain in which I pointed out that the haunting had evidently no particular connection with the house, but only with the girl herself, and that the sooner she was married, the better, as it would give Beaumont a right to be with her at all times, and further than this, it might be that the manifestations would cease if the marriage were actually performed. The old man nodded agreement to this especially to the first part, and reminded me that three of his girls, who were said to have been haunted, had been sent away from home and met their deaths while away. And then, in the midst of our talk, there came a pretty frightening interruption, for all at once the old butler rushed into the room, most extraordinarily pale. "'Miss Mary, sir! Miss Mary, sir!' he gasped. "'She's screaming! Out in the park, sir, and they say they can hear the horse!' The captain made one dive for a rack of arms and snatched down his old sword and ran out, drawing it as he ran. I dashed out and up the stairs, snatched my camera flashlight and a heavy revolver, gave one yell at Parskett's door, the horse, and was down and into the grounds. Away and in the darkness there was a confused shouting and I caught the sounds of shooting out among the scattered trees. And then from a patch of darkness to my left there burst suddenly an infernal gobbling sort of neighing. Instantly I whipped round and snatched off the flashlight. 
The great light blazed out momentarily, showing me the leaves of a big tree close at hand, quivering in the night breeze, but I saw nothing else. And then the tenfold blackness came down upon me, and I heard Parskett shouting a little way back to know whether I'd seen anything. The next instant he was beside me, and I felt safer for his company, for, th for there was some incredible thing near to us, and I was momentarily blind because of the brightness of my flashlight. What was it? What was it? He kept repeating in an excited voice, and all the time I was staring into the darkness and answering mechanically, I don't know, I don't know. There was a burst of shouting somewhere ahead, and then a shot. We ran towards the sounds, yelling to the people not to shoot, for in the darkness and panic there was this danger also. Then there came two of the gamekeepers racing hard up the drive with their lanterns and guns, and immediately afterward a row of lights dancing towards us from the house, carried by some of the men servants. As the lights came up, I saw we ha had come close to Beaumont. He was standing over Miss Hiskins, and he had his revolver in his hand. Then I saw his face, and there was a great wound across his forehead. By him was the captain, turning his naked sword this way and that, and peering into the darkness. A little behind him stood the old butler, a battle-axe from one of the armstands in the, in the hall, in his hands. But yet yeah, there was nothing strange to be seen anywhere. We got the girl into the house and left her with her mother and Beaumont, whilst a groom rode for a doctor. And then the rest of us, with four other keepers, all armed with guns and carrying lanterns, searched round the home park. But we found nothing. When we got back, we found that the doctor had been. He had bound up Miss Beaumont's wound, which luckily was not deep, and ordered Miss Hisgin straight to bed. I went upstairs with the captain and found Beaumont on guard outside of the girl's door. I asked him how he felt, and then, so soon as the girl and her mother were ready for us, Captain Hiskins and I went into the bedroom and fixed the pentacle again round the bed. They had already got lamps about the room, and after I had set the same order of watching as to the previous night, I joined Beaumont outside of the door. Let's take a break there. How are we doing in the chat? How are we finding the story so far? Now that's a butler, says Whale Puck. Oh yeah. So intense, grabbing an axe off the wall. <laughs> oh no. None your business, says, I want to know, have you ever seen the rains? <laughs> Coming down on a sunny day. I love that song. Bit of Credence. Bit of CCR. Doesn't go amiss in these streams. And NimbleTac, thank you for the super chat, says, Really love these stories, and they're helping get me through all these months of lockdown on my own. I'm tempted to try reading some of my own short stories at some point. You absolutely should. They're really fun. They're really fun. Give them a read. Give them a read. That horse is badass, says Fancy Space Owl. Can't disagree there. I mean, we're, we're, we're still straight into it, folks, aren't we? The pace on this story is bananas I I feel like I part of me wants to kind of like pause and 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 see see how everyone's enjoying the story but but there's a ghost horse haunting everyone another part of me just wants to crack on keep going nimble tax says they seem to be intent on trying to beat up and shoot this horse yeah a lot of gunfire. A lot of gunfire in this story, bearing in mind we are clearly talking about a ghostly horse. I don't know what you think you're going to accomplish shooting the ghost horse. But they see, seem determined to give it a try. All right. <laughs> Black Beauty got mean, says Lucentheus. All right. I feel like the chat at the moment is mostly horse puns. Seo says, it's a horror action genre for all of the Karnaki stories. Yeah. Or, like, more than most of the stories we read, which have this kind of, like, slow build-up to, to a sort of horrifying haunting. This is, um... Yeah, this is just just gallops straight into it. All right, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going.
So where were we? They had already got lamps about the room, and after I had set the same order of watching as on the previous night, I joined Beaumont outside of the door. Pasket had come up while I had been in the bedroom, and between us we got some idea from Beaumont as to what had happened out in the park. It seems that they were coming home after their stroll from the direction of the West Lodge. It had got quite dark, and suddenly Miss Hiskin said, Hush, and came to a standstill. He stopped and listened, but heard nothing for a while. Then he caught it. The sound of a horse, seemingly a long way off, galloping toward them over the grass. He told the girl that it was nothing, and started to hurry her toward the house, but she was not deceived, of course. In less than a minute they heard it quite close to them in the darkness, and they started running. Then Miss Hisgins caught her foot and fell. She began to scream, and that is what the butler heard. As Beaumont lifted the girl, he heard the hoofs come thudding right at him. He stood over her and fired all five chambers of his revolver right at the sounds. He told us that he was sure he saw something that looked like an enormous horse's head right upon him in the light of the last flash of his pistol. Immediately afterwards he was struck a tremendous blow, which knocked him down, and then the captain and the butler came running up, shouting. The rest, of course, we knew. About ten o'clock the butler brought us up a tray, for which I was very glad, as the night before I had got rather hungry. I warned Beaumont, however, to be very particular not to drink any spirits, and I also made him give me his pipe and matches. At midnight I drew a pentacle round him and Pasket, and sat one on each side of him, outside the pentacle, for I had no fear that there would be any manifestation made against anyone except Beaumont or Miss Hiskins. After that we kept pretty quiet. The passage was lit by a big lamp at either end, so that we had plenty of light, and we were all armed, Beaumont and I with revolvers, and Pasket with a shotgun. In addition to my weapon I had my camera and flashlight. Now and again we talked in whispers, and twice the captain came out of the bedroom to have a word with us. About half past one we had all grown very silent, and suddenly, about twenty minutes later, I held up my hand silently for there seemed to be a sound of galloping out in the night. I knocked on the bedroom door for the captain to open it, and when he came I whispered to him that I thought we heard the horse. For some time we stayed listening, and both Pasket and the captain thought they heard it, but now I was not so sure, neither was Beaumont. Yet afterward I thought I heard it again. I told Captain Hiskins I thought he had better go into the bedroom and leave the door a little open, and this he did. But from that time onward we heard nothing, and presently the dawn came in, and we all went very thankfully to bed. When I was called at lunchtime I had a little surprise, for Captain Hiskins told me that they had held a family council and had decided to take my advice and have the marriage without a day's more delay than possible. Beaumont was already on his way to London to get a special licence, and they hoped to have the wedding the next day. This pleased me for it seemed the sanest thing to be done in the extraordinary circumstances. And meanwhile I should continue my investigations, but until the marriage was accomplished, my chief thought was to keep Miss Hiskins near to me. After lunch I thought I would take a few experimental photographs of Miss Hiskins and her surroundings. Sometimes the camera sees things that would seem very strange to normal human eyesight. With this intention, and partly to make an excuse to keep her in my company as much as possible, I asked Mrs. Hiskins to join me in my experiments. She seemed glad to do this, and I spent several hours with her, wandering all over the house from room to room, and whenever the impulse came I took a flashlight off her, and the room or corridor in which we chanced to be in at that moment. After we had gone right through the house in this fashion, I asked her whether she felt sufficiently brave to repeat the experiments in the cellars. She said yes, and so I rooted out Captain Hiskins and Pasket, for I was not going to take her even into what you might call artificial darkness without help and companionship at hand. When we were ready, we went down into the wine cellar. Captain Hiskins carrying a shotgun, and Pasket a specially prepared background and a lantern. I got the girl to stand in the middle of the cellar, whilst Pasket and the captain held out the background behind her. Then I fired off the flashlight and we went into the next cellar, 
where we repeated the experiment. Then in the third cellar, a tremendous pitch-dark place, something extraordinary and horrible manifested itself. I had stationed Miss Hiskins in the centre of the place with her father, and Parsket holding the background as before. When all was ready, and just as I pressed the trigger of the flash, there came in the cellar that dreadful, gobbling neighing that I had heard out in the park. It seemed to come from somewhere above the girl, and in the glare of the sudden light I saw that she was staring tensely upwards, but at no visible thing. And then, in the succeeding comparative darkness, I was shouting to the captain and Parsket to run Miss Hiskins out into the daylight. This was done instantly, and I shut and locked the door afterwards, making the first and eighth signs of the Sama ritual outside, opposite to each post, and connecting them across the threshold with a triple line. In the meantime, Parsket and Captain Higgins, ca Higgins carried the girl to her mother and left her there, in a half-fainting condition while I stayed on guard outside of the cellar door, feeling pretty horrible for I knew that some disgusting thing inside was waiting there. And along with this feeling there was a sense of half-ashamedness, rather miserable, you know, because I had exposed Miss Higgins to the danger. I'd got the captain's shotgun, and when he and Parsket came down again they were each carrying guns and lanterns. I could not possibly tell you the utter relief of spirit, spirit and body that came to me when I heard them coming, but just try to imagine what it was like standing outside of that cellar, can you? I remember noticing, just before I went to unlock the door, how white and ghastly Parsket looked, and the old captain was grey-looking, and I wondered whether my face was like theirs. And this, you know, had its own distinct effect upon my nerves, for it seemed to bring the beastliness of the thing crashing down on me in a fresh way. I knew it was only sheer willpower that carried me up the door and made me turn the key. I paused one little moment, and then with a nervy jerk sent the door wide open and held my lantern over my head. Parsket and the captain came one each side of me and held up their lanterns. But the place was absolutely empty. Of course I did not trust to a casual look of this kind, but spent several hours with the help of the two others in sounding every square foot of the floor, ceilings and walls. But in the end I had to admit that the place itself was absolutely normal. And so we came away. But I sealed the door and outside, opposite each doorpost, I made the first and last signs of the Sama ritual, joined them as before with a triple line. Can you imagine what it was like searching that cellar? When we got upstairs, I inquired very anxiously how Miss Hiskins and the girl came on. And she herself told me that she was all right, and that I was not to trouble about her or blame myself, as I told her I had been doing. I felt happier and then went off to dress for dinner. And after that was done, Parskis and I took one of the bathrooms to develop the negatives that I had been taking. Yet none of the plates had anything to tell us, until we came to the one that was taken in the cellar. Parsket was developing, and I had taken a batch of the fixed plates out into the lamplight to examine them. I had just gone carefully through the lot when I heard a shout from Parsket, and when I ran to him, he was looking at a partly developed negative, which he was holding up to the red lamp. It showed the girl plainly, looking upward, and I had, as I had seen her, but the thing that astonished me was the shadow of an enormous hoof right above her, as if it were coming down on her out of the shadows. As you know, I had run her bang into that danger. That was the thought that was chief in my mind. As soon as the developing was complete, I fixed the plate and examined it carefully in a good light. There was no doubt about it at all. The thing above Miss Hisgins was an enormous, shadowy hoof. Yet I was no nearer to coming to any definite knowledge, and the only thing I could do was to warn Parsket to say nothing to it about the girl it would only increase her fright, but I showed the thing to her father, for I considered it right that he should know. That night we took the same precaution for Miss Hisgin's safety as on the two previous nights, and Parsket kept me company. Yet the dawn came in without anything unusual having happened, and I went off to bed. Let's take a break there. Ghost loot confirmed. Oh my goodness, what happened? Um, oh no, there's been another pun. <sighs> I've just seen it. It's Capra Lord. Capra Lord in the chat says, OMG, OMG, you guys, I've got it. Luke, 
Western A. No, 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 no. We can't have that. We can't allow this to happen, folks. We can't let this... We can't... I can't let that stick. <laughs> Unbelievable. Hell is empty and all the horses are here, says John Sharplin. Oh my gosh. It's just all horse puns in the chat. Our, ho our, our ghost story book club has completely fall fallen apart. Completely fallen apart because... Because all it is now is horse puns. <laughs> uh, I'll read some of them, yeah. Yeah, sure. Why not? <sighs> Luke, you need a drink because you sound a little hoarse, says Angela Sanchez. Of course. Matt Sequel says, we must ex horse size these puns. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Wow, Luke, you're really losing the reins on these streams. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, boy. It's just all puns. It's all puns. <laughs> oh, Ellen's in the chat as well. Hey, Ellen. Ellen's complimenting that exorcise. Exorcise, that's very good. Luke, why the long face, says Laura Ann. No, by, see now, see now, look, by reading them, I've encouraged them accidentally. I've encouraged them, and now there's going to be more of them. Now there's going to be more of them. You pun so hard that you summoned Ellen. I can't believe this. Sarah H says, get off your high horse. Don't judge us. Capra Lord says, this is the proudest I've ever been of myself. Suck it, my graduation. Well, you know what? If if this stream gives you that feeling of uh, that swelling feeling of pride, Fran Fry says, "Don't be so negative." <sighs> all I want, all I wanted to do, was to read a very serious ghost story about a horse, a ghost horse, and you've derailed it with puns. All right. Dan says to stop the jokes, you need to break out the electric puntacle. Like electric pentacle. Dan. You hate to see it. <laughs> this is gelding out of hand, says Elijah Ramirez. Oh my goodness. I... Fancy Space Owl, thank you for the super chat, says this is for your therapy to recover from all the horse puns. Hope it helps. Thanks. Thanks. I don't think Luke has enough beer for this, says Matt's equal. Yep, 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 yep. Luke, you keep encouraging them, says Shy Violet. No. Nay. Even. All right. All right, well, I probably shouldn't finish the story. I reckon it's probably just time to delete the channel. I'll do that now. Yeah, click, click over there. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. studio. Yep, yeah. settings. There it is. Yep, yeah. okay, all right. I'm ready now. Ready, to, ready. <laughs> Madison Kirkpatrick says, Luke, can we go back to the tail? But tail is spelt T-A-I-L, you guys. All right, I'm just going to I'm just going to push I'm just going to push on. I'm just going to push on because I think despite all the puns you folks want to know what happens with the story. You want to know what what's going on with the haunted horse. I do. I want to know. I mean actually, yeah, to be honest, I I already know because I have read the story already. But strap in folks is all I can say. All right. Ooh, my hair's gone a bit out of control. Hang on, let me rough it up a little bit. You got to take a minute. Oh no! Oh dear! Oh man, I keep making it messier. 
this is not this is not this is not premium content is it me just faffing around with my hair sean burnham thank you for the super chat says the scariest part of this stream is the puns yeah i agree all right well why don't we crack on see if we can get something a bit more frightening here we go oh, everyone in the chat is saying i'm combing my mane don't worry about your hair luke says laura money it looks hot to trot you need a grooming, it seems, says Laura Dealey. You know what, though, I have in I have in the past used a hair used a hairbrush that's like the like a horse brush. You know, like those kind of like Fran Fry says, "Tame your mane." Thank you, Fran Fry. You know, the ones that are like circular. That's like a disc. You put your hand in a strap and brush the horse, brush the nice horse. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I've used one of those before and it was surprisingly good. Right, I'm going to fix my hair. Hang on. It's looking looking in a looking in a mirror reflection here. Right. That'll have that'll have to do. Oh man, it looks, it looks all it's the heat, the humidity's mess, mess messing with me. All right, we'll leave it like that. Ah. Oh. I'm just going to keep reading the story. I have to believe there are some people in the chat. I have to serve those people who aren't in the chat looking at the horse puns, but who want to. Nonyo Business, thank you very much. Very generous Super Chat says, I for one am proud to have contributed to this chaos. No point closing the barn door, ne the barn door now. No, the horse has bolted. And I'll tell you what horse has bolted is the horse of the invisible in this story. Right, I'm cracking on, cracking on. I'm just, I'm going like this so I can't see the chat and the horse puns. Okay, here we go. Where were we? Yet the dawn came in without anything unusual having happened and I went off to bed. When I got down to lunch, I learned that Beaumont had wired to say that he would be in soon after four, also that a message had been sent to the rector, and it was generally plain that the ladies of the house were in a tremendous fluster. Beaumont's train was late and he did not get home until five, but even then the rector had not put in an appearance, and the butler came in to say that the coachman had returned without him, as he had been called away unexpectedly. Twice more during the evening the carriage was sent down, but the clergyman had not returned, and we had to delay the marriage until the next day. That night I arranged the defence round the girl's bed, and the captain and his wife sat up with her as before. Beaumont, as I expected, insisted on keeping watch with me, and he seemed in a curiously frightened mood. Not for himself, you know, but for Miss Hiskins. He had a horrible feeling, he told me, that there would be a final dreadful attempt on his sweetheart that night. This, of course, I told him, was nothing but nerves. Yet really it made me feel very anxious, for I've seen too much not to know that under such circumstances a premonitory conviction of impending danger is not necessarily to be put down entirely to nerves. In fact, Beaumont was so simply and earnestly convinced that the night would bring some extraordinary manifestation that I got Paskett up to rig a long cord from the wire of the butler's bell to come along the passage handy. To the butler himself I gave directions not to undress and to give the same order to two of the footmen. If I rang, he was to come instantly, with the footmen carrying lanterns, and the lanterns were to be kept ready lit all night. If, for any reason, the bell did not ring and I blew my whistle... He was to take that as a signal in place of the bell. After I had arranged all these minor details, I drew a pentacle about Beaumont and warned him very particularly to stay within it, whatever happened. And when this was done, there was nothing to do but wait and pray that the night would go as quietly as the night before. We scarcely talked at all, and by about 1am we were all very tense and nervous, so that at last Paskett got up and began to walk up and down the corridor, to steady himself a bit. Presently I slipped off my pumps and joined him and we walked up and down, whispering occasionally for something over an hour, until in turning I caught my foot in the bell cord and went down on my face, but without hurting myself or making a noise. But when I got up, Paskett nudged me. Did you notice that the bell never rang? He whispered. Joe, I said, you're right. Wait a minute, he answered. I'll bet it's only a kink somewhere in the cord. He left his gun and slipped along the passage and, taking the top lamp, tiptoed away into the house, carrying Beaumont's revolver ready in his right hand. 
He was a plucky chap, I remember thinking just then, and again later. Just then, Beaumont motioned to me for absolute quiet. Directly afterward, I heard the thing for which he listened. The sound of a horse galloping out in the night. I think that I may say I fairly shivered. The sound died away and left a horrible, desolate, eerie feeling in the air, you know. I put my hand out to the bell cord, hoping Pasket had got it clear. Then I waited, glancing before and behind. Perhaps two minutes passed, full of what seemed like an almost unearthly quiet. And then suddenly down the corridor at the lighted end there sounded the clumping of a great hoof. And instantly the lamp was thrown with a tremendous crash and we were in the dark. I tugged hard on the cord and blew the whistle. Then I raised my snapshot and fired the flashlight. The corridor blazed into brilliant light, but there was nothing. And then the darkness fell like thunder. I heard the captain at the bedroom door and shouted to him to bring out a lamp quick. But instead something started to kick the door. And I heard the captain shouting within the bedroom and then the screaming of the women. I had a sudden horrible fear that the monster had got into the bedroom. But in the same instant from up the corridor there came abruptly the vile gobbling neighing that we had heard in the park and the cellar. I blew the whistle again and groped blindly for the bell cord, shouting to Beaumont to stay in the pentacle whatever happened. I yelled again to the captain to bring out a lamp and there came a smashing sound against the bedroom door. Then I had matches in my hand to get some light before that incredible unseen monster was upon us. The match scraped on the box and flared up dully and in the same instant I heard a faint sound behind me. I whipped round in a kind of mad terror and saw something in the light of the match. A monstrous horse head close to Beaumont. Look out, Beaumont! I shouted in a sort of scream. It's behind you! The match went out abruptly, and instantly there came the huge bang of Pasket's double barrel, both barrels at once, fired evidently single-handed by Beaumont close to my ear, as it seemed. I caught a momentary glimpse of the great head in the flash, and of an enormous hoof amid the belch of fire and smoke seeming to be descending upon Beaumont. In the same instant I fired three chambers of my revolver. There was the sound of a dull blow, and then that horrible, gobbling neigh broke out close to me. I fired twice at the sound. Immediately afterwards something struck me and I was knocked backwards. I got onto my knees and shouted for help at the top of my voice. I heard the women screaming behind the closed door of the bedroom, and I was dully aware that the door was being smashed from the inside, and directly afterward I knew that Beaumont was struggling with some hideous thing near to me. For an instant I held back, stupidly paralysed with funk, and then blindly and in a sort of rigid chill of goose flesh I went to help him, shouting his name. I can tell you I was nearly sick with the naked fear I had on me. There came a little choking scream out of the darkness, and at that I jumped forward into the dark. I gripped a vast, furry ear. Then something struck me, another great blow knocking me sick. I hit back, weak and blind, and gripped with my other hand at the incredible thing. Abruptly I was dimly aware of a tremendous crash behind me, and a great burst of light. There were other lights in the passage, and a noise of feet and shouting. My hand grips were torn from the thing they held. I shut my eyes stupidly and held a heard a, yowd, a loud yell above me, and then a heavy blow like a butcher chopping meat. And then something fell upon me. I was helped to my knees by the captain and the butler. On the floor lay an enormous horse head, out of which protruded a man's trunk and legs. On the wrists were fixed great hoofs. It was the monster. The captain cut something with the sword that he held in his hand and stooped and lifted off the mask, for that is what it was. I saw the face then of the man who had worn it. It was Parskett. He had a bad wound across the forehead where the captain's sword had bit through the mask. I looked bewilderedly from him to Beaumont, who was sitting up leaning against the wall of the corridor. Then I stared at Parskett again. By Jove! I said at last, and then I was quiet, for I was so ashamed for the man. You can understand, can't you? And he was opening his eyes, you know, and I had so grown to like him. And then, you know, just as Parskett was getting back his wits and looking from one of the other, from one to the other of us and beginning to remember, well, there happened a strange and incredible thing. For from the end of the corridor there sounded suddenly the clumping of a great hoof. 
I looked that way and then instantly at Parskett and saw a horrible fear in his face and eyes. He wrenched himself round weakly and stared in mad terror up the corridor to where the sound had been, and the rest of us stared in a frozen group. I remember vaguely half sobs and whispers from Miss Hiskins's bedroom, all the while that I stared frightenedly up the corridor. The silence lasted several seconds, and then, abruptly, there came the clumping of the great hoof, away at the end of the corridor, and immediately afterwards the clunk, 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 clunk of mighty hoofs coming down the passage toward us. Even then, you know, most of us thought it was some mechanism of Parskett still at work, and we were in the queerest mixture of fright and doubt. I think everyone looked at Parskett, and suddenly the captain shouted out, Stop this damned fooling at once! Haven't you done enough? For my part, I was now frightened, for I had a sense that there was something horrible and wrong. And then Parskett managed to gasp out, It's not me! By God, it's not me! My God, it's not me! And then, you know, it seemed to come home to everyone in an instant that there was really some dreadful thing coming down the passage. There was a mad rush to get away, and even old Captain Hiskins gave back with the butler and the footmen. Beaumont fainted outright, as I found afterwards, for he had been badly mauled. I just flattened back against the wall, kneeling as I was, too stupid and dazed even to run. And almost in the same instant the ponderous hoof-falls sounded close to me and seemed to shake the solid floor as they passed. Abruptly the great sound ceased, and I knew in a sort of sick fashion that the thing had halted opposite to the door of the girl's bedroom. And then I was aware that Parskett was standing, rocking in the doorway with his arms spread across so as to fill the doorway with his body. Parskett was extraordinarily pale, and the blood was running down his face from the wound in his forehead. And then I noticed that he seemed to be looking at something in the passage with a peculiar, desperate, fixed, incredibly masterful gaze. But there was really nothing to be seen. And suddenly the clunk, 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 clunk recommenced and passed onward down the passage, in the same moment, Parskett pitched forward out of the doorway onto his face. There were shouts from the huddle of men down the passage, and the two footmen and the butler simply ran, carrying their lanterns. But the captain went against the side wall with his back and put the lamp he was carrying over his head. The dull tread of the horse went past him and left him unharmed, and I heard the monstrous hoof-falls going away and away through the quiet house, and after that a dead silence. Then the captain moved and came towards us, very slow and shaky, and with an extraordinarily grey face. I crept towards Parskett, and the captain came to help me. We turned him over, you know. I knew in a moment he was dead, but you can imagine what a feeling it sent through me. I looked at the captain, and suddenly he said, That... Uh, that... and I knew that he was trying to tell me that Parskett had stood between his daughter and whatever it was that had gone down the passage. I stood up and steadied him, though I was not very steady myself. And suddenly his face began to work and he went down on his knees by Parskett and cried like some shaken child. Then the women came out of the doorway of the bedroom and I turned away and left him to them while I was over Beaumont. This is practically the whole story. The only thing that is left to me is to try to explain some of the puzzling parts, here and there. Perhaps you have seen that Parskett was in love with Miss Hiskins, and this fact is the key to a good deal of the facts that were extraordinary. He was doubtless responsible for some portions of the haunting. In fact, I think for nearly everything. But you know I can prove nothing, and what I have to tell you is chiefly the result of deduction. In the first place, it is obvious that Parskett's intention was to frighten Beaumont away, and when he found he could not do this, I think he grew so desperate that he really intended to kill him. I hate to say this, but the facts force me to think so. I'm quite certain it was Parskett who broke Beaumont's arm. He knew all the details of the so-called horse legend, and got the idea to work upon the old story for his own end. He evidently had some method of slipping in and out of the house, probably through one of the many French windows, or possibly he had a key to one or two of the garden doors, and when he was supposed to be away, he was really coming down on the quiet and hiding somewhere in the neighbourhood. The incident of the kiss in the dark hall I put down to sheer nervous imaginings on the part of Beaumont and Miss Hiskins. 
Yet I must say that the sound of the horse outside of the front door is a little difficult to explain away. But I'm still inclined to keep to my first idea on this point, that there was nothing really unnatural about it. The hoof sounds in the billiard room and down the passage were done by Parsket from the floor below, by bumping up against the panelled ceiling with a block of wood tied to one of the window hooks. I proved this by an examination which showed the dents in the woodwork. The sounds of the horse galloping round the house were possibly also made by Parsket, who must have had a horse tied up in the plantation nearby, unless, indeed, he made the sounds himself. But I do not see how he could have gone fast enough to produce the illusion. In any case, I don't feel perfect certainty on this point. I failed to find any hoof marks, as you remember. The gobbling neighing in the park was a ventriloquial achievement on the, park of par on the part of Parsket, and the attack out there on Beaumont was also by him, so that when I thought he was out in his bedroom, he must have been outside all the time, and joined me after I ran out of the front door. This is almost probable. I mean that Parsket was the cause, for if it had been something more serious, he would certainly have given up his foolishness knowing that there was no longer any need for it. I cannot imagine how he escaped being shot, both then and in the last mad action of which I have just told you. He was enormously without fear for any kind of him... He was enormously without fear of any kind for himself, as you can see. The time when Parsket was with us, when we thought we heard the horse galloping round the house, we must have been deceived. No one was very sure, except, of course, Parsket, who would naturally encourage the belief. The neighing in the cellar is where I consider there came the first suspicion into Parsket's mind that there was something more at work than his sham haunting. The neighing was done by him in the same way that he did it in the park, but when I remember how ghastly he looked, I feel sure that the sounds must have had some infernal quality added to them, which frightened the man himself. Yet later he would persuade himself that he had been getting fanciful. Of course, I must not forget that the effect upon Miss Hiskins must have made him feel pretty miserable. Then, about the clergyman being called away, we found afterwards that it was a bogus errand, or rather, call, and it is apparent that Parsket was at the bottom of this, so as to get a few more hours in which to achieve his end. And what that was, a very little imagination will show you. For he had found that Beaumont would not be frightened away. I hate to think this, but I'm bound to. Anyway, it's obvious that the man was temporarily a bit off his normal balance. Love is a queer disease. Then there is no doubt at all but that Parsket left the cord to the butler's bell hitched somewhere, so as to give him an excuse to slip away naturally to clear it. This also gave him the opportunity to remove one of the passage lamps. Then he had only to smash the other, and the passage was in utter darkness for him to make the attempt on Beaumont. In the same way, it was he who locked the door of the bedroom and took the key. It was in his pocket. This prevented the captain from bringing a light and coming to the rescue. But Captain Hiskins broke down the door with the heavy fender curb, and it was his smashing the door that sounded so confusing and frightening in the darkness of the passage. The photograph of the monstrous hoof above Miss Hiskins in the cellar is one of the things that I am less sure about. It might have been faked by Parsket while I was out of the room, and this would have been easy enough to anyone who knew how. But you know, it does not look like a fake. Yet there is as much evidence of probability that it was faked as against, and the thing is too vague for an examination to help a definite decision, so that I will express no opinion one way or the other. It is certainly a horrible photograph. And now I come to that last dreadful thing. There has been no further manifestation of anything abnormal, so that there is no extraordinary uncertainty in my conclusions. If we had not heard those last sounds, and if Parsket had not shown that enormous sense of fear, the whole of this case could be explained in the way which I have shown. And, in fact, as you have seen, I am of the opinion that almost all of it can be cleared up, but I see no way of going past the thing we heard and the fear that Parsket showed. His death! No, that proved nothing. At the inquest it was described somewhat untechnically as due to heart spasm. That is normal enough and leaves us quite in the dark as to whether he died because he stood between the girl and some incredible thing of monstrosity. The look on Parsket's face and the thing he called out when he heard the great hoof sounds coming down the passage seemed to show that he had the sudden realisation of what before then may have been nothing more than a horrible suspicion. And his fear and appreciation of some tremendous danger approaching was probably more keenly real even than mine. And then he did the one fine great thing. And the cause? 
I said. What caused it? Kanaki shook his head. God knows, he answered with a peculiar, sincere reverence. If that thing was what it seemed to be, one might suggest an explanation which would not offend one's reason, but which may be utterly wrong. Yet I have thought, though it would take a long lecture on thought induction to get you to appreciate my reason, that Parsket had produced what I might term a kind of induced haunting, a kind of induced simulation of his mental conceptions to his desperate thoughts and broodings. It is impossible to make it clearer in a few words. But the old story, I said. Why, may, may there not have been something in that? There may have been something in it, said Karnaki, but I do not think it had anything to do with this. I have not clearly thought out my reasons yet, but later I may be able to tell you why I think so. And the marriage, and the cellar, was there anything found there? asked Taylor. Yes, the marriage was performed that day in spite of the tragedy, Karnaki told us. It was the wisest thing to do, considering the things that I cannot explain. Yes, I had the floor of that big cellar up. If I had a feeling, I might find something there to give me some light. But there was nothing. You know, the whole thing is tremendous and extraordinary. I shall never forget the look on Paskett's face. And afterward, the disgusting sounds of those great hoofs going away through the quiet house. Karnaki stood up. Out you go, he said in a friendly fashion, using the recognised formula, and we went presently out into the quiet of the embankment, and so to our homes. The end! What the hell? Okay, right, okay. When I, when I read this story, I was like, am I going to be able to get through this thing with a straight face? Because I could not stop laughing at the idea that... At the, at the sheer idea that Parskit was like, man, sure do, <laughs> sure do love Ms. Hiskins. <laughs> how to win, <laughs> how to win her over. I, ha I have it. I will dress as a horse and kill her boyfriend. <laughs> I'll put on a big horse head. <laughs> He puts on... It's the worst plan in the world. <laughs> he puts on a big horse head. And, like... And just sort of, like, <laughs> runs around. Just, like, runs around making neighing sounds. And the neighing sounds were him. Everyone was convinced it was a ghost horse. But it was him going... <laughs> anyway. Anyway, I'm sorry. That story is, like... The least scary story we've ever done. I was not, I was not like spooked at any point. I just, <laughs> I just, for me, the challenge of that was getting through it without laughing because I could remember that it was a dude wearing a big horse head going, <laughs> running up and down a corridor in the dark going, <laughs> And everyone believed it was a ghost. <laughs> there is... There is no way... There is no way that you... that um, There is no way that, that, that a man can dress as a horse in a way that is not only convincing, but that is convincing that it is a terrifying ghost horse that everyone should be very afraid of. And what's his plan? In the corridor, there's like three people with guns and he's just like <laughs> trying to shoot the ghost horse and he's just running around <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry the story really cracks me up it is <laughs> it is just a mental image that is very funny and there's a lot to get into there's a lot to talk about that is just absolute nonsense like what does Karnaki say at the end there? He's like, it's, it's like, oh, do you think like, um, uh, like, what about the old, what about the old horse? What about the stories though of the ghost horse? And Karnaki's like, hmm, there may have been something in it, but I don't think so. And I haven't figured out why. I might figure out why later and I'll tell you. And it's just like, William Hope Hodgson, the author, just like, he's, he's, done at this point you know he's like i don't know man like it was a, it, <laughs> it's a 
a Scooby Doo. It was just, it was just like some Scooby Doo dude in a horse head galloping around. What was his plan? He wanted to kill Beaumont. If you want to kill Beaumont, don't dress as a ghost horse and try and kick him to death. Just like shoot him with a gun. <laughs> Or stab him with a sword. You know, the kind of weapons that everyone else in the room has to kill the ghost horse that they know is coming. <laughs> How did he not get shot, says a random lady. Well, that's explained. Because obviously as you're reading it, you're like, well, oh my gosh, they're doing all this shooting, all these bullets, and they're not hitting the ghost horse. Wow, it must be a powerful demon. And then at the end, it's just like, oh, I guess, I guess, I guess he just got real lucky not to be shot. Okay, I'm going to check in with the chat in a moment. I just have to get all these laughs out of my system because I was holding them into that whole story. And it was hard. It was hard because this story is ridiculous and it's not scary. It didn't... S <laughs> you know what the thing is? Like, there were points early on where I was like, okay, there's some good... There's, there's co there, in particular, there's one bit near the beginning which is like, um, Beaumont tried to open the door but he felt as if someone was pulling it tight from the other side and I was like, ooh... Ooh, that's scary. That reminds me of the thing in the other story, the last Karnaki story with like, you just get the impression that whatever's on the other side of the door, that somehow it's soft and it's very creepy. Um, that creeped me out. But then I think fundamentally the concept of a ghost horse is too funny. In the year 2020, the concept of a ghost horse is too funny for a ghost horse story to be scary. And that is not to do down the, the, the writing, which, which I, you know, I really enjoy. It's hard, hard to read. I stumbled quite a lot. I, you know, I try and do my best, but like these sentences are a real mouthful. Um, but just, I, I think, I think the ghost horse story does not work. I, I was so excited to read this one though, because, because it's just wild. The horse haunting is wild. The revelation that it's a, a dude it, with a big horse head running up and going. And, and then he's like on the floor below with a wooden thing. Like going like, they, they will think this is a horse hoof. Like on the ceiling, like clip clop, clip clop, clip clop. And freaking everyone out. But why? To, to the end of why? It's the worst plan. It's the worst plan I've ever heard. <laughs> and it, and then in the end, he is killed by a legit ghost horse. <laughs> okay, I can see loads of very, very generous chat messages coming in. So I'm, I'm going to check in now. Now that I've recovered. Okay. Okay, here we go. Ah. <laughs> oh. Hannah Axelson says, I feel like I'm partly to blame for the pun, so I apologise. I guess it's only fair that I pony up some money. Oh, Hannah. That was a great pun you did, Hannah. That was amazing. Matt Sequel says, we love you for indulging our puns. Hope all the talking on the streams doesn't leave you. Horse. It, all the laughing at the end has left me horse. Kelsey Schoenbaum, thank you, says so much. Uh, thanks so much for the streams, Luke. I'm starting a new job next week, so sadly this might be the last one I can catch live. Very well, everyone. Oh, Kelsey, uh, Best of luck starting the new job. I hope it goes really well. I'm sure you'll smash it. Fran Fry says that Beaumont was trying to winny her heart. Trying to winny her heart. If you want to win her heart, don't dress as a horse and kick her fiancé to death. I don't claim to be an expert on romance. But like... Tip to... You know, like... Just don't... Dress, don't dress as a horse and kick her fiancé to death. I don't know how I can put that in plainer terms. <laughs> Gentle Madrill says, let's get some seriousness in here between all these puns. Man, these Karnaki stories are wild. Like, what? Didn't expect that Scooby-Doo twist. It was pretty hilarious. Like, how do you come up with such a ridiculous plan? I don't know. What I think happened was that the author, Hodgson, bless his heart, was like, it would be cool if the ghost was actually like one of the characters. I, I'd be really interested to know how many ghost stories had been written, written at the time 
that had a kind of Scooby-Doo villain reveal. Um, because if not many, then this could be, this could have been, you know, fairly innovative. You certainly don't see it coming. I, I really don't feel like you could get away with that kind of twist now, though, because it doesn't hold up to even the merest scrutiny, because it's like, it doesn't make sense that, that also, like, there's a photograph of the big hoof, and then at the end, it's just like, I feel like the only way out of it in the end is to sort of be like, well, maybe there was also a ghost. Maybe there was a ghost horse and like a dude horse, a fake dude horse. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, but I do know that my green screen is failing. Hang on, let me try and address that one second. Hang on, I'm doing a real bad job here. Okay, that nearly got it. Hang on. Oh, oh gosh, no, that's done some terrible things. There we go. You know what? That'll do. That'll do. We've read the story now. Um. Wow. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's keep. Let's keep going. <laughs> John Burnham says, "I'm glad this one caused a few laughs. Thanks for the stream, and may I wish you the best of luck in your DMing tomorrow. Look after yourselves, everyone. Thank you, John Burnham. That's uh." uh Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you for the super chat and thanks for the best of luck. I will need it all. Mason Britt says, Karnak, 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 this is like Karnaki talking now. So there was this guy and he dressed as a horse to scare his crush's lover and also maybe a real ghost horse or maybe not. Hell if I know. Anyway, look at the time. Please now leave now. Bye. 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 <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Karnaki at the end is just like, I guess we'll never know about the ghost. Everyone out. Semek George says, to be fair, Dob disguised dragon, um, a dragonborn as a seahorse, if I remember correctly. Looks like horse costumes just work. Yeah. Yeah, that costume did work. And Annie, Annie Wan says, this was better than I ever could have dreamed. Thanks. Andrew D, just with a, a generous super chat. Thank you very much, Andrew D. And Vivian Sassidaran says, <laughs> quoting me now, I don't claim to be an expert on love. Just don't put on a horse mask. Luke Westway 2020. Need this on a shirt. Maybe. Maybe we should start. Maybe we should do merch. And the first merch should be. I'm no expert on love. But don't dress as a horse and kick their fiance to death. <laughs> I can't. I, can't, I just can't with this story. It really makes me. The mental image as well. Also. He's got the he's got the horse head, right? This is how it's described. He's got a big horse head. Nothing on nothing below. Just his regular human clothes. But then <laughs> hoofs on his hands, I think it was. I'm gonna need to check that. I'm gonna need to fact check that. Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> It said, it said, um, where are we there? Ooh, we're screaming. Oh, here we go. On the floor lay an enormous horse head out of which protruded a man's trunk and legs. On the wrists were fixed great hoofs. So he's got like, he's got like, he's like, he gets the big horse head and he gets the hoof hands and he's like, this is it. This is going to freak him out. Also, like, this dude who's doing this, Parsket, he's part of the investigative squad. He's there for all the hauntings. And it's like, how do... how? And they say that his... They, they The gobbling neighing in the park was a ventriloquial achievement on the Pask of Parsket. So that's presumably him throwing his voice. It, like in some sort of carnivalesque vaudeville way to sort so that he can so that he can be there being like oh my god i hope there's no ghost horses everyone back to back face outwards while throwing his voice over out to the darkness being like <laughs> it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense at all um right hang on gosh look, i'm getting all red in the face from giggling uh, Alex o, uh, Alex o Tang Curry, I'm going to uh, read that as, says, um, breaking lurk mode just to say, hey, 
and folks. Hey, is spelt H A Y. Seriously though, love these streams. Great entertainment in these very weird times. Good luck tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really appreciated. And Nonyo Business says, seriously though, kissing noises? Right. The, so the kissing, the kissing, no, the kissing noises. Did we get an explanation as to the kissing noises? With regard to the kisses, oh no 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 wait hang on, the incident of the kiss in the hall I put down to sheer nervous imaginings. Sure, fine, if you like. <laughs> I mean, fine. Fancy Space Hell says, Luke, thank you so much for your streams. They're fantastic and definitely helping during these times. I'm bad at horse puns, so, uh, hey there. <laughs> That's a good horse pun. None of your business says, oh, 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 sorry. Seriously, though, kissing noises. Yep. Fran Fry says, I'll gladly offer up my fan art for merch. That's very, that's a kind offer, Fran Fry. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll have to think about it. I'll have to think about this merch, merch idea. Having only suggested it jokingly just now. Gentle Mandrill says, also, yeah, good luck tomorrow with your DMing. Don't worry too much about it. You got this. Excited to see what shenanigans you come up with. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, cool. Okay. So that was, by any measure, I think, a pretty unscary ghost story. I think that's fair to say. Not very frightening. Kind of dumb. But I bloody loved it. I bl I just I will be laughing maybe for the rest of my life every time I picture him in the corridor stamping up and down. <laughs> Philip Ratkovich says, if you thought this was tense, read the sequels, The Donkey of the Invisible and The Camel of the Unseen. Never knew quadruped costume can be utilized in horror. Yeah. Unscary and dumb, but quite the ride, says Katie Douglas. And yeah, you know what? I think I think that's that's a more concise and better review than um than than I will manage. Becky S says, "Dress up and ventriloquism." There you go. Now get out. That's what Karnaki says. <laughs> yeah. Jenny Munchkin says, "Not scary, but this is the best laugh I've had in a long time." Bless these horse puns and the Scooby Doo villain. Yep. Okay, right. Well, folks, I think that's going to about do it from me. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you, everyone, for your um, generous, generous comments. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I'll, I'll, tr I'll try and find one that's a bit scarier next week. Um, we've done two Karnaki stories in a row, so I'll probably, I'll probably try and like mix it up, mix it up a little now. Um, oh. I love her, but she loves another. There must be some way. Wait. Wait. <laughs> and then Basket. Basket is having... Basket is just walking down the road. And he just happens to pass. <laughs> a taxidermist. With having a clearance sale on horse heads. Wait. <laughs> right i'm probably getting giddy now okay i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to punch out folks thanks so much i'm sorry this one wasn't scary but was dumb but i hope you enjoyed it uh yeah i'm sure i'll see lots of you tomorrow on the outside extra and outside xbox streams that'll be really fun looking forward to them cool thank you so much uh everyone in the chat um oh, fran fry says remain unhaunted folks that's it remain unhaunted however you want to spell it however into horse puns you are however you want to spell that until next time folks remain unhaunted thank you again everyone this has been really fun this is really really oh man i can't believe i made it through the story knowing the ending but i did it i did it thanks folks take it easy see you next time remain unhaunted have a lovely have a lovely rest of your week stay safe out there See you next time. Oh, wait, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Why am I not vanishing in a scary way? Okay, here we go. Here we go. No! <laughs>